seated on that. That concludes the questions on the Cabinet Secretary's statement. Apologies to those who didn't get taken, but we did run out of time with lots of people left over. The next item of business is a debate on Motion 3438 in the name of Donald Cameron on retaining the Highlands and Islands Enterprise Board. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please? And we have no time spare at all in this debate. Uh, so very, very strict eight minutes, please, Mr Cameron, to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Deputy Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. At the outset of this debate, it's worth casting our mind back some 50 or so years to 1965 when HIE's predecessor, the Highlands and Islands Development Board, was set up. At that time, the Highlander was described as the man on Scotland's conscience. There had been more than 100 years of population loss, low productivity, low income levels and a lack of basic infrastructure were widespread. There had been some improvements, but the glens and islands were still emptying and a way of life vanishing. Into that void stepped the board. It had six members of staff and a budget of £150,000. Today, HIE has 322 employees and a budget of £74.5 million, albeit that sum has ominously just been cut by 11% in the draft budget. Its 1965 name is instructive. It was a board, not simply another government body, but a board, a board whose remit was specific and definitive, a board with extensive powers dedicated to reversing population decline and revitalizing the economy across the highlands and islands, a board which uniquely saw the significance of social development alongside economic development because it was as important to regenerate communities as it was the economy. And when renamed HIE by a Conservative government in 1991, the board remained intrinsic and HIE continued with its unique remit to the present day. In fact, the board is more than intrinsic. In terms of its legal definition, HIE is defined in primary legislation as the members of its board. So contrary to what the government amendment says, any change to the status of the board will necessarily change the legal status of HIE. In law, HIE is its board and the board is HIE. And it follows that when we debate the proposed abolition of this board today, we're not simply discussing the dry technical structure of just another government agency. We are debating the fundamental nature of HIE and what it does. We mustn't be sentimental. HIE is not perfect. It hasn't got everything right. It should probably have concentrated more on the peripheral areas currently at risk of depopulation in the north and west. And not all of its projects have succeeded, although an enterprise agency is in the business of risk, so there will always be winners and losers. But undoubtedly, it has been a force for good. We now have 20% of Scotland's enterprises in the Highlands and Islands, despite only having 9% of the population. This is a remarkable achievement, as is the fact that the declining population trend has been reversed growing by 22% since 1965. That's nearly 100,000 people, more than double the national average. HIE has played a major part in the thriving tourism industry, the University of the Highlands and Islands, transport infrastructure, etc. It has invested in cultural activities, in common the Gaelic, Fashion the Gael, and more recently, community land ownership. It has truly transformed the region. And to those who say, well, don't worry, HIE will carry on doing what it always has done. Its network of offices across the region will continue. Nothing will change, people say. I say this. If this ill-conceived proposal goes ahead, everything will change. With respect, there are plenty of organisations which have a presence in towns across the Highlands and Islands, any High Street Bank, for example, but which plainly operate as national, not local bodies. It's the board that makes HIE special. Having a separate and independent board allows HIE to use the experience and expertise of business leaders to further its aims. When giving evidence to the Economy Committee last month, the interim chief executive said the board helped HIE prioritise where strategy was implemented. The knowledge and expertise of board members based on the walks of life from which they come, she said, is useful, as is their insight into the Highlands and Islands. She said HIE ensured that board members spent time meeting and engaging with businesses and communities as a visible face of HIE. She said something which is, this is something which is appreciated 
by these communities because they have an opportunity to talk to and to influence the board. That's why it's imperative that the HIE board remains and continues to take all strategic, operational and budgetary decisions, as the motion states. Nothing else will do because nothing else will achieve the same kind of success. Be in no doubt the loss of the board effectively means the end of HIE as we know it. I defy you to find, I, I don't have time I'm afraid, I defy you to find an organisation which supports this proposal. As Keith Brown revealed last month at the Economy Committee, when he was unable to name one body in favour of abolition of any of the current boards. And the prevailing mood in the Highlands and Islands is the same. The Highland Council recently agreed a motion which spoke of the further distancing of decision making and strategy from local communities. Jim Hunter, a highly respected figure and an SNP member, has spoken of centralism run riot and ministerial control freakery. Those last comments demonstrate that at the heart of all this, something much deeper and more profound is happening, something that impacts on everyone in Scotland, the inexorable centralising agenda of this government. It is, a tragic, it is a tragic tale. First it was the police, then the fire service. Now we know there will be cuts to the core grant of local government. There is talk of super helpers. I don't have time, and um, you will have time to respond in your speech. The narrative of centralisation is fixed and unrelenting. A COSLA report in 2014 described Scotland as the most centralised country in Europe. It's no wonder that many of us believe that disbanding HIE's board is simply the next chapter in that story. Another local body replaced by an all Scotland organisation based here under the watchful eyes of its political masters. Let me even hazard a guess at a name, Enterprise Scotland, perhaps. It's all so predictable. And with HIE, note the ultimate irony. It was a UK government in faraway Westminster that gave us the board, but it's the Scottish government here in Edinburgh that takes it away. <laughs> and that this should be at the hand of the Scottish National Party, of all people, a party of devolution, a party of autonomy. But when it comes to localism, a party whose instincts are anything but local. Because you can't preach community empowerment and at the same time, remove powers from local organisations. And you, 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 you don't help communities in the peripheral areas of remote and rural Scotland by passing power in completely the opposite direction. So for the SNP, Highlands and Island MSPs, some of whom are here, memories are long in our part of the world, and the people of the Highlands and Islands will remember how you vote tonight. There are some very basic questions you must ask yourself. Either you believe that power is best exercised closest to the people it affects, or you don't. Either you believe in local communities deciding for themselves what's in their best interests, or you don't. Either you believe in allowing for diversity and divergence from central government, or you don't. What's it to be? For in the vote tonight, we have an opportunity in this chamber to say enough is enough, to stand up for small communities and businesses across Scotland, to end the withdrawal of decision-making powers from our localities, to end the hoarding of power and influence in the centre, and to end, once and for all, control over vast areas of Scottish life, passing from the many to the few. I move the motion in my name. I now call on Keith Brown to speak to and move Amendment 3438.2 up to six minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. First, I'd like to make clear that uh, where uh, possible, I uh, fully intend to listen to the points that have been made. I would like to engage, and actually an intervention might have helped in, in that regard. Uh, but I would like to work closely with MSPs from across the Chamber to explore where there are constructive ideas about how we can support and maintain sustainable and inclusive economic growth, and to protect, as we have guaranteed to do, local decision-making, local management, and local delivery. The point I was going to make is it seems impossible to reconcile the fact that we are about to establish the first government to establish a South of Scotland agency or the work that's going on in terms of regional partnerships as part of this review with an idea of centralisation. It's the very reverse uh, of centralisation. However, my determination to deliver better economic and social outcomes for all of Scotland means I can't support the Conservative motion. I'd like to briefly explain the rationale for uh, change and the actions which will ensure that High continues to deliver for the Highlands and Islands and for Scotland. High is not being abolished. 
When we announced the Enterprise and Skills Review, our aim was, no, I'm sorry, I think we're in the pattern of not taking intervention. I'm sorry, if it's Liz Smith, I recognise her interest and I'll take that intervention. I thank, the cabinet secretary, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for doing so. Uh, just in terms of rationale, uh, could the Cabinet Secretary spill out whether he has had any communications from the four boards that he proposes to abolish and what advice he's been getting from them? Keith Brown. Yeah, I've had, uh, it would take me some time to recite all the information contained in letters, but I've had various correspondence uh, from the boards, and they, uh, as you would expect, raise uh, an awful lot of issues which are very supportive of what the government is doing, and they also raise issues of concern in relation to that, perhaps too much to go into in a short six-minute speech. I'm happy, as I've done already, though, to have a further conversation with Liz Smith about that, if she wants to do that. Uh, when we announced the review, our aim was to drive forward a long-term ambition embedded in Scotland's economic strategy to rank in the top quartile of OECD countries for productivity equality, well-being and sustainability. This ambition, ambition is the foundation for the work of our enterprise and skills agencies. And by creating greater alignment, that would help high. That would make sure that the international support, which we don't have enough of just now, that perhaps more local decision-making in terms of skills, uh, skills development could also take place uh, in the Highlands and Islands as well, could result from that greater alignment and cohesion. We recognise the strengths of the four agencies and also that, as good as they are, and I think this point was conceded by Donald Cameron, there is more that they can do. They have developed since they were conceived, first of all. They've changed their name, they've changed their structure, they've certainly grown in size. Uh, it is frequently said, as Donald Cameron mentioned, by other parts of the Highlands and Islands, that they feel they could do with more of a, a presence from high in their own, own areas as well. It's an important uh, lesson there as well. So the first phase of the review that we've undertaken has shaped that vision, guiding principles and a set of, under, a set of actions under uh, seven particular themes. Moving ahead, we will strengthen that strategic direction and the governance of our enterprise and skills system, and also ensure that appropriate regional approaches uh, are undertaken and that we take action on, as I've mentioned, internationalisation, innovation, skills, digital and enterprise support. The review that we undertook has focused on how best we can ensure that our agencies are working together. Respondents said there was a complex and cluttered landscape which was often confusing and that we needed clearer alignment of our services to deliver our national ambitions. That's why we'll align these key agencies under a strategic Scotland-wide board and also protect local decision-making, local management and local delivery. I say once again, high will not be abolished. I, I will do. Gail Ross. Sorry, thanks. Um, given the SNP Highlands and Islands members met with you several months ago to discuss this very topic, will you now commit to be open-minded about retaining some sort of mechanism that ensures local decision-making in the Highlands and Islands? And when the second part of the review does uh, come back, will you uh, commit to bring that back to this chamber for a full discussion on the findings and the recommendations? Keith Brown. Well, in addition to the points which have been made to me by Gail Ross, by Kate Forbes, by Richard Lockhead uh, and others in relation to what the structure should be beneath the strategic uh, board and um, in relation to the, each of the agencies, a number of proposals have been put forward. There are some that have appeared in the press talking about supervisory boards and um, a advisory boards as they appear in other countries. We have, from within those that are currently undertaking the review, which will be led by Professor Lorne Creera, the chair of High, uh, suggestions about that as well. We've had suggestions from other members of the different agencies. So we have that ability to look at that possibility for what uh, is the nature of the decision-making powers which are exercised by uh, that, um, uh, that tier between, if you like, the strategic board and the agency. So yes, I do undertake, and actually I spoke to Lorne Creera this morning to make sure that his review, which has already begun, takes into account that the government's uh, open mind in relation to that. And I'm also happy to concede to the point made uh, by Gail Ross, that I am more than happy to uh, come back to the Chamber once we have the governance review, not the phase two review, happy to come back then as well, of course, but in terms of the governance review, I recognise the interest that is both from the motion and the amendment and the discourse I've had with individual members. So we do recognise there are strengths of the four agencies and also that as good as they are, we do have to always seek to try to improve those. I recognise the success, which Donald Cameron talks about, of high over a number of years, a, a substantial success. One reason why, and the South of Scotland members here will also attest to this, one reason why they have championed having something similar in their area as well. That's a recognition of the success of high. But we have to build on these things in future. And that additional support which high uh, needs to have in terms of internationalisation, perhaps additional powers in terms of local decision making, should be an outcome of this review. And that review should focus on how we also get the agency 
agencies themselves to work together. So it is in that relation uh, a question of building on success and engaging with the agencies uh, and delivering more for Scotland. The debate, uh, I think, confirms all uh, that we all in this chamber recognise that High is a real success story. And the transformation, as has been mentioned, of the Highlands and Islands over the last 51 years is testament to that. Uh, the status quo, I think, given not least the comments made by Donald Cameron, should be recognised as not being an option. We always look to see to how we can improve we these things. Come to a close the future please, of high security is not being abolished, and I look forward to the rest of the debate. I now call Rhoda Grant to speak to and move Amendment 3438.1. No more than five minutes, please, Ms. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the debate and indeed support um, the motion. Highlands and Islands Development Board and Highlands and Islands Enterprise have over 50 years of proven economic and social success between them. And why would anyone want to dismantle that? Despite how the SNP government wriggle and recant, that's exactly what they're trying to do. When John Swinney announced the end of the High Board, it was met with anger and disbelief in the Highlands and Islands. In Let me make some progress. In response, um, Keith Brown tried to appease by saying that he would expect that there would be a strong Highland representation on the new single board. He also told me that there was no commitment to a single geographical headquarters for the new board. Does this mean they haven't decided where the new board will be located? Indeed, or maybe it's not going to have a base at all. The more, we dig, the more digging we do on this, the more it seems clear that they're making it up as they go along. Their only aim is centralisation, a power grab, ignoring the needs of the Highlands and Islands. They want to take away the very essence of Highlands and Islands enterprise, which has its roots firmly based in the re region, making it subject to a board with an organisation covering not only enterprise, but education and skills too. A very brief intervention. Kate Except, Forbes. Does the member accept that only phase one has been published and the reason that we don't have all the details is that we await phase two and does she accept that she voted for the government's motion welcoming the publication of phase one which states that a statutory board would be created? Rhoda Grant. There, we know now, what we didn't know at the time of that vote, that the Board of High was going to be dismantled. That was sneaked out in answer to a different question. We didn't have that information. We, we actually give the government the benefit of the doubt, which is something maybe we'll learn from in, in the future. In 1965, Highlands and Islands Development Board was funded. Its main remit was to stem population decline from the North West Highlands and the islands and at the same time enhance the economic and social needs of the whole area. And most people agree, including the Cabinet Secretary, that has been a success. The last count, the population had increased by 20%. But that's not to say job done. There are many parts of the region still facing challenges as great as they did in 1965. And we re need to redouble our efforts to meet the demands and challenges of those communities. And this is where High Social Remit comes in and why we put down our motion. They have used their funding and knowledge to support businesses that would not have been supported elsewhere in order to strengthen communities and ensure people have access to services. Businesses such as, businesses such as pubs and petrol pumps, businesses that you would never support in other parts of Scotland. And that's why our, our amendment seeks to emphasise that point. We have seen economic development over the last decades, but this has decreased over the last years due to budget cuts. Communities complain, of course they do, that they're not able to get the help from High that they once did. That's what they want. They want High with its own distinct board. They want High with the ability it once had to grow their local economies. The approach of the Scottish Government should not be a surprise. They have a track record on centralisation. In the Highlands and Islands, we once had our own police force governed by a joint board made up of locally elected representatives. They centralised that. They did the same with Highlands and Islands Fire Service, now centralised, all with disastrous results for service delivery. This time it's high. What next? The Scottish Government must recognise they have no support for this plan. They can't tell us who supports the scrapping of the high board. I can give them a lengthy list of those who totally oppose the scrapping of the High Board. For example, um, Dr Stephen Clarkson from Orkney Island Council told me, before long, with a single police force, a single ambulance service, single fire and rescue service, etc., this country will have come to resemble a large English county. The SNP will have transformed Scotland into Scotshire. 
How ironic, as Donald Cameron said, the HIDB was set up by a UK government in Westminster and is now being dismantled by a Scottish government here in Edinburgh. That was not the aim of devolution. Regardless of what they say, this is taking powers away from the Highlands and Islands and centralising them. Power over how you spend your budget is the crux of decision making. Therefore, the new board will retain power simply by being able to open and shut the funding tap. Presiding officer, we must make a stand, a stand not just to save the high board, but the very essence of high itself, to demand the re-empowering of the organisation that made a real difference to the economy of the Highlands and Islands. And I also make a direct plea to SNP MSPs for the Highlands and Islands tonight. You might have been put up for election by the SNP, but you, are you were elected by your constituents. Don't let them down tonight. I move the amendment in my name. We now move to the open speeches, and we're extremely tight for time. In order not to jeopardise the next debate, could I ask all speakers to aim for three and a half minutes, please? And I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I, I will try and cut my time down uh, to meet your deadlines. In 1995, when I started working in Inverness, I had little knowledge of HIE. In fact, if I'm truthful, I was somewhat sceptical of what they'd achieved and what they could achieve. But in the 15 years that I worked as a surveyor covering the Highlands, my views changed, and I came to appreciate what HIE achieved in the North. Of course, there were times when my original scepticism surfaced, but that was when the HIE board became political rather than dealing with Highland issues. It's therefore perhaps strange that I'd like, as my colleague uh, Donald Cameron has done at the outset of my speech, to identify with somebody that I would not, not naturally do, Professor Jim Hunter. Now, where we agree is his comment on the SNP government's plans for HIE, and I paraphrase, as Donald did, to say that what he said was, in a country as diverse as ours, this is centralism running riot. I agree. We must never forget why HIE exists. Simply put, it's to increase the number of people who choose to live, work and study and invest in the Highlands and Islands. And what we should be asking is, is do they do that well? I believe they do. And I'm going to give you three, sorry, two brief examples uh, due to time. First of all, the Inverness City deal. The HIE worked with the Highland Council, UHI and Inverness Chamber of Commerce to make viable proposals. A result, a £350 million investment. As far as the EA, UHI is concerned, HIE invested £25 million in the campus to help make it possible. The result is a campus that we can be proud of with huge diversity. So what does this excellent work cost Scotland? Well, as we heard, it's £74 million, but shortly to be cut. So is that good value to answer that, uh, good value for that? Before I answer that question, it's worth pointing out that we've already seen the SNP cutting the budget of HIE by 11% in six years, abolishing the 10 local enterprise boards, and to quote Jim Hunter, turning the organisation into a Scottish Government delivery agency. I'm, I'm sorry, I am so pushed for time. I, I, I know you've had one already. Now, as a Tory, I have to put myself in a dangerous position for a second time by quoting Professor Jim Hunter again. And that's not once, but twice. And that's somebody, if somebody is right, you have to understand that I will stand with them. And therefore, we shouldn't allow the government to do further by making the board, removing the board and making it purely into a delivery agency. So, I think what I've proved is that in this situation, in local situations, that we accept that there is more likely to, to succeed if the decision is kept local. And who can deny this? In fact, the examples that I've given you prove this. And that's why the board needs to be local and not elsewhere in Scotland. <clears throat> now, we're all told by the Scottish Government, as Donald has pointed out, that there's been plenty of support for their plan in scrapping the HIB, HIE board and assuming it within a national body. The problem is, we still haven't heard who supports it. And furthermore, what I don't understand is how, when the First Minister says HID, HIE does a fantastic job, her Cabinet can, in, can interpret that as a signal to break it up. Now, before I close, I'd just briefly like to mention, and very briefly like to mention, the MP for Roskai and Loch Harbour in Blackford's compromise on how to dilute the dissent for the government's suggestions. Well, we've done that, and I've given it the attention it deserved. 
So let us move on. In summary, I'm going to say this. Listen to what's being said to you. The HIE is not broken. It works. Stop trying to break it. Kate Forbes, followed by David Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Words are so devalued in our political discourse that they're hurled about until the air is so thick with exaggeration, hyperbole and superlatives that it's impossible to see the truth. The future of Highlands and Islands Enterprise is the latest battleground in our war of words, and I'm really quite disappointed that opposition parties have spread such fear, such fear amongst local communities and HIE staff with their irresponsible rhetoric. And for Donald Cameron to praise land reform when his party voted against it smacks of the same hypocrisy. That's one thing that the Highlands and Islands haven't forgotten. So let's be clear. Dean Lockhart said this morning that HIE was to be abolished, and that is a downright mistruth. We need a strong economy, not for its own sake, but because our friends and family members need job opportunities, a steady income and reliable public services across this country. And HIE has been instrumental in turning the Highlands around in the last 50 years. It's done that interestingly, partly with over 23 million in EU funding between 2007 and 2013. So the cheek, the absolute cheek for the Conservatives to accuse this government of undermining HIE when their London colleagues will be pulling the rug from under the feet of HIE on EU funding and other funding for the Highlands and Islands. The purpose, the purpose of this review the purpose of this review is to empower HIE with more resources and to, sorry, Edward Mountain, and to expose HIE to more international opportunities. All that whilst still maintaining the current management structures, the office of the chief executive, the staff, the local decision makers. In other words, the Scottish Government's review was to strengthen HIE's service to communities. That is devolution of power, not centralisation. With pleasure. Rhoda Grant. Is, is the member actually saying the board has no purpose at all? And if so, why are we setting up an overreaching board if that's the case? Kate Forbes. It's a good point. It's a fair point. I do think the board does have an important role to play. I think what we've seen over the last few years is that our economy is changing. We need to open up new opportunities. I look, for example, I come from an agricultural background. Opportunities for export for our food and drink are there's far fewer opportunities in the Highlands at the moment under the current arrangements than there would be if you provided more collaboration with other enterprises whilst maintaining local decision-making powers and powers over budget, which I agree with her in her earlier statement. But I would say, first and foremost, to look at what the Scottish Government has done, often in partnership with HIE over the last few years and months, Look at how the Scottish Government worked with HIE to safeguard 150 jobs at the Lochaber smelter and unlock the potential to create hundreds more. Look at the 80 miles of the A9 being finally duelled on time and within the £3 billion budget after decades of waiting under Labour and Liberal and Tory governments. Look at the tens of affordable homes being built across the Highlands and Islands. Look at the communities who own acres and acres of their own land with new land reform legislation and an expanded Scottish land fund. Look at the investment in tourism, food and drink and renewable energy across the Highlands. Look at these things. Look at the exact wording in the review. Look at the need to support businesses and communities in the Highlands. And I think we should stop spreading fear. As an MSP, as an MSP for an area of the Highlands who has lived, worked and gone to school in the Highlands, who loves the Highlands, I look at these things, that list of investment and partnership, and I see a government who is empowering Highland communities. David Stewart, followed by Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It has never been more important than today that all the country's resources should be fully exploited, and the Highlands and Islands have much to contribute. This is not a case of giving to the Highlands. This is a case of giving the Highlands a chance to play their part in the future of Britain. The words of iconic Secretary of State for Scotland, Willie Ross, speaking in the House of Commons during the second reading of the Highland Development Scotland Bill, which set up the groundbreaking Highlands and Islands Development Board in 1965. HIDB was set up 
with operational freedom and shackled by ministerial direction, and with combined economic and social development tools. In 1991, of course, High took HIDB's place, and both Conservative Secretary of States, Rifkin and Lang, kept these principles alive in the new body. Professor Jim Hunter has been quoted earlier today, the ex-chair of High and an SNP supporter, said in the Press and Journal last month, the Scottish Government's decision to deprive the Highlands and Islands of its enterprise of its own board is no bolt from the blue. It's the culmination of repeated moves by SNP ministers to rein in and now end the independence of the North's Development Agency. In my view, President Officer, it's crucial to keep the High Board to fight creeping centralisation and to allow the strategic direction for High to devise and form formulate its own priority initiatives, keeping faith with the spirit of Willie Ross's passionate address in the Commons in March 1965. So the big question today is, why abolish High's board? Surely, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Where is the stampede of local people and organisations building the barricades to demand change? Name them. Hands up how many backbench SNP members for the Highlands and Islands want this move? How will High's unique social function be protected? And where's the evidence of duplication? Who will employ the High staff? Who will employ the High chief executive, the High board, or the super quangle? <laughs> Will the changes require fresh legislation, which may well be defeated? Or will the Cabinet Secretary sneak through a so-called Henry VIII order, using powers in Part 2 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act? I looked at this earlier, President Officer, and members will be aware that this relates back to the statute proclamation in 1539, which gave Henry VIII to make proclamations by statute. Clearly, the Cabinet Secretary has been taking some history lessons over the last few days. Who will chair this super board? Who will be the members? And I will be very happy to supply a free map of the Highlands and Islands to successful applicants, if so required. And finally, President Officer, I would like to thank the Scottish Conservatives for their positive initiative in securing this debate. <laughs> Not words often heard from this side of the chamber, which... Um, reinforces the cross-party consensus on this issue. The SNP face almost universal criticism in the Highlands Lions for their centralisation agenda. Opposition from the Lib Dems, from the Greens, from the Tories and from Labour, and not forgetting the Highland Council as well. Within their own ranks, it's caused discomfort in the SNP backbenches. And spies tell me that the SNP group in Westminster are muttering into their beer in a stranger's bar because of the lack of consultation from SNP High Command over the abolition of the board. Con President Officer, tonight there is a chance for democracy to strike back. All we need is the will to do and the soul to dare. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I call... I know time is tight, so speech is up to three and a half minutes, please, or people at the end will lose their speaking time. Ivan McKee to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Mr McKee, please. Uh, thank you, um, President Officer. And firstly, can I remind the Parliament of my role as the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. President Officer, the work of uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise is well recognised, providing valued services to the businesses and communities of the region. There is no doubt a successful Scotland requires a successful economy, and the Highlands and Islands and High is seen as a key driver of that success. The commitment of this Scottish Government to the Highlands and Islands cannot be doubted. The recent deal to enhance the Fort William smelter and hydro power station, adding high value manufacturing and bringing in significant external investment alongside Scottish Government support demonstrates that. The dueling of the A9 and of the A96, together with the focus on delivering broadband across the Highlands and Islands as a priority, will significantly improve connectivity. So let's be clear about the proposals outlined in the Scottish Government's Enterprise and Skills Review. As the Government Amendment states, High will continue to retain its legal status, its own Chief Executive, its own dedicated management team, its local base, its local decision-making powers. It will continue to have autonomy over local decisions using local expertise and knowledge. All of the factors that drive its success will continue. This is not in doubt. The same services will continue to be delivered by the same people to businesses and communities in the Highlands and Islands, which will continue to access those services through local staff and local offices as they do now. 
Scotland has enjoyed success in terms of inward investment over recent years, a large part of that down to the work of our enterprise agencies, including HI. But the challenges ahead require us to do more and to do better. If we are to reach the top quartile of OECD nations for economic growth, productivity and social inclusion, and we are to do so against the headwinds created by the chaos and confusion of Brexit, then more of the same will not be enough. As well as asking our businesses, as well as asking our businesses to innovate, we need to innovate across the whole range of enterprise and skill support services offered by the government. Business respondents to the review pointed to a cluttered landscape with a lack of clarity on roles and responsibilities, leading to duplication and suboptimal use of resources. The system was viewed as lacking coherence and coordination, lacking a strategic focus with a single vision, goals and shared ownership is required to deliver more effective collaboration. This is not a nice to have, it is essential to support Scottish business to perform and compete at the levels we need to, to deliver inclusive growth across the Scottish economy. The review makes clear that a greater degree of coordination is required, and the best way to achieve that is for a strategic board, ensuring the different agencies complement and enhance each other. The new single strategic Scotland-wide statutory board will coordinate the activities of Scottish Enterprise, High, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. This will bring greater integration, coordination, coherence and focus to the delivery of our enterprise and skills support to businesses and users of the skills system, strengthening governance. And it will enable robust evaluation and development of common targets that are aligned with the national performance framework and economic strategy to aid performance. In conclusion, there is no threat to high in the work it does to benefit the economy of the Highlands and Islands. The changes in the uh, re uh, review will enable High to leverage the support of other agencies and to move forward to the next level of its work. And the Government amendment recognises this. Thank you. Thank you for your timing, Mr McKee. Andy Whiteman, to follow by Liam MacArthur. Mr Whiteman, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Donald Cameron for bringing this important debate to the Chamber this afternoon. My colleague John Finney has been long, long been an advocate and enthusiastic supporter of the role Highlands and Islands Enterprise plays in the Highlands and Islands and regrets that he's unable to be here in person to speak in this debate. Uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and in a former guise, the HIDB, have been serving communities in the north of Scotland for over 50 years and in that time has have achieved remarkable things. The Highlands and Islands faces unique challenges and opportunities and those needs are best met in our view by a development agency which can take the big view and the long view on the development of the Highlands and Islands and which implements its distinctive social purpose alongside conventional economic development concerns. The report of the phase one review highlights the distinctiveness of the Highlands and Islands and the need for an agency that, and I quote, is locally based, managed and directed. This sentiment is at odds with the government's proposals to abolish the high board. The Scottish Government's consultation summary notes that there were, and I quote, very few negative issues of note in relation to High, and responses mentioning High were very positive in relation to their specific expertise and support to strengthen communities and address issues faced by remote, rural and fragile areas. On the 29th of September last year, John Finney was given assurances by the First Minister that High would remain in a position, and I quote, to carry out its functions and provide its excellent services to the Highlands and Islands. This afternoon, I have three questions for the government. Number one, can the cabinet, cabinet secretary explain how scrapping the board and amalgamating it with other agencies will ensure a continued focus on the Highlands and Islands? Number two, can he tell me how he proposes to bring forward his proposed changes? Does he plan to introduce primary legislation to enact them? Or, as David Stewart was suggesting, does he intend using the order making powers in part two of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010 as they apply to Schedule 5 bodies. The third, and this is a crucial question, is around status. The Cabinet Secretary told the Economy Committee on the 20th of December 2016 that in relation to Scottish Enterprise and High, and I quote, there will be no change to their status, end quote. Mr Brown's amendment talks of retaining legal status. But status and legal status are both ambiguous terms. Mr. Brown has legal status. I have legal status. Donald Trump has legal status. But we are very different entities. The acid test is, and this was the scenario I put to Mr. Brown in December's economy committee meeting, the acid test is if after the reforms, High 
could take Scottish enterprise to court over, for example, the disputed liability over property on the Isle of Arran. Would they be able to do that? I'm not suggesting for a moment that they would wish to, but would they be able to do that? In other words, will High retain not its legal status, but its legal personality after the reforms? Presiding officer, High plays a vital role in supporting communities and businesses across the Highlands and Islands. It's widely supported. The changes proposed by the government are, in our view, unnecessary and could well undermine the excellent work done by High. We see no evidence or reason at this time to change the governance of High, and Greens will be supporting the motion in the name of Donald Cameron. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Whiteman. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Officer. Can I start by thanking Donald Cameron for making this debate possible and for the motion which Scottish Liberal Democrats will heartedly support. I also thank the Press and Journal for the vigorous campaign it has fought over the last few months uh, to keep high local. It has been in the best traditions of campaigning journalism, exposing uh, the lack of a basis or support for the government's proposals and keeping the issue firmly in the public eye. Finally, can I record my thanks to local businesses in Orkney across a range of sectors who have taken time to voice their concern to the SNP's plans to abolish High's board. And I've listened closely to the Cabinet Secretary and his backbench colleagues this afternoon as they desperately seek to justify these proposals. In response, I'm tempted just to quote, as others have, the highly respected former HIE Chair Professor Jim Hunter. This would at least give Parliament a fair represent uh, representation of the concerns felt by my constituents and people across the Highlands and Islands. It would also, I suggest, more accurately reflect the views of most SNP activists and members in the region of which Professor Jim Hunter counts himself as one. He speaks for most, I believe, when declaring there is no case other than ministerial control freakery for undermining an agency whose record shows it to be one of Scotland's success stories. In 1965, HIDB was, as David Stewart said, established with government funding, with, but with powers to act at its own hand. Roll forward half a century and how things have changed. While well, the First Minister was happy to join High's 50th birthday celebrations last year, since taking office, the SNP has taken a hatchet to HIE. First, Mr Swinney's decluttering of the landscape saw local enterprise boards decluttered out of existence, including Scottish Borders Enterprise, yes. and tens of millions of pounds uh, uh, raided from High's budget. Now the agency is to be stripped of its strategic responsibility for economic development in the Highlands and Islands, including the, uh, the distinctive social cohesion aspect. It is simply not credible to argue that a single overarching super board encompassing enterprise skills and funding agencies for all of Scotland will have the necessary laser-like focus on the needs of the Highlands and Islands. Yes, effective collaboration between these bodies is essential, but for the last 10 years, SNP ministers have assured us that this was happening. Now, out of the blue, we're told by Keith Brown that abolishing High's board and centralising strategic decision-making is the only way of making this happen. Unfortunately for the government, no one else seems to agree. Certainly, no one who contributed to the first phase of the government's enterprise and skills review appears to agree. This idea was cooked up in Butte House by a government with an unhealthy appetite for controlling absolutely every aspect of what goes on in our country. At a time when High desperately needs reinvigorating, rediscovering the early ambition, creativity and independence, SNP ministers seem intent on neutering it. Starving High of funds and freedom is not the recipe for success. In conclusion, let me again quote Professor Jim Hunter. In a country as diverse as ours, this centralism run riot needs resisting. The Cabinet Secretary and SNP Highlands and Islands MSPs should take heed. This unwarranted power grab must be abandoned and power left where it is needed in the Highlands and Islands. I hope Parliament will reach the same conclusion at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McCarthy. I call Dave Lockhart, to be followed by John Mason. Mr. Mason is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Lockhart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We agree that a review of enterprise and skills policy is an important and um, urgent priority in order to promote economic growth and skills development in Scotland. Indeed, figures published only today by the Scottish Government show the economy continues to struggle with GDP growth 
of only 0.7% in the past year, compared to 2.2% for the rest of the UK. And figures uh, today also show unemployment has increased in the last quarter to 5.1%, compared to a UK average of 4.8%. Given this economic background, we do support some of the objectives outlined in the Scottish Government's Phase 1 report on enterprise and skills, including the need for greater alignment and accountability across enterprise and skills agencies. However, as set out in our motion today, we categorically do not support the abolition of the Board of the Highlands and Islands Enterprise. In addition, we do not support the proposed 33% reduction in the government's budget for enterprise support, but I, given the time constraints, I will leave that for another day. The SNP's amendment to our motion highlights that High will retain its separate legal status and local base, but this misses the central issue at the heart of today's debate. As other members have highlighted, High's unique social and economic remit has shaped and been shaped by the unique needs of the Highlands and Islands communities and the businesses it supports. The Board of High plays a central and vital part in all of this. High is not just an enterprise development agency like Scottish Enterprise, it has a unique and distinct remit to support and develop communities. These unique needs are identified and addressed by a dedicated uh, high board. Indeed, Jim uh, Hunter, who wins the award of most quoted today by far, has called the Scottish Government's attempt to scrap the board as being a direct assault on the founding principles of high. Giving evidence to the Economy Committee, the Chief Executive of High commented that the Board helps to prioritise and implement strategy across the Highlands and Islands and also highlighted the knowledge and expertise of Board members and we want that to continue. As other members have highlighted, while there has been a number of responses from stakeholders against this proposal, there have been very little or no evidence of support for the Government proposal. Presiding officer, the real answer to achieving improved alignment, accountability and performance across the enterprise and skills agencies, as well as higher economic growth in Scotland, was highlighted by the Audit Scotland report supporting Scotland's economic growth, when it stressed the following, and I quote, the enterprise bodies are performing well, but the Scottish Government needs a clearer plan for delivering its economic strategy. We agree. So I suggest the Government follows the advice of Audit Scotland and takes a much closer look at its own performance and its own strategy and how it implements policy instead of dismantling the board of HIE, which has been successful. I'm just about to conclude. Member can't give ways in his to last To conclude, sentence. the Government should have, by now, should have learnt the lessons from the disastrous centralisation of Police Scotland. Centralising decision-making is not the right answer when different parts of Scotland have very different needs and policy requirements. The Scottish, Government, uh, the Scottish Conservatives are clear. Reverse the decision to scrap the Board of High and keep a local board that understands the needs of the Highlands and Islands. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call John Mason, last speaker. Mr Mason, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. As has been mentioned, we spent a fair bit of time at the Economy Committee looking at the enterprise agencies, uh, Scottish Enterprise and HIE in particular, and that has included our examining the Audit Scotland report, uh, which I have here, supporting Scotland's economic growth, which was published in July. So I thought I would focus my remarks on some of that report. A lot of it is very positive, and Audit Scotland describes what is done, what has been done by HIDB and then HIE since 1965, and the SDA and SE since 1975. But a lot has changed since that time. For example, it says in the, on page 7 of the report, the Scottish Government should work with relevant partners to identify the full range of public sector support for businesses, to identify duplication and potential gaps, and to ensure that public sector support complements private sector support. It, it goes on, I could quote a lot, but I will show, uh, restrict how much I, I quote from it today, but it goes on in uh, page 28, paragraph 67. It is not possible to directly compare Scottish enterprises and HIEs spending. Both record their spending against their individual priorities and categories. This means it is not possible to compare, for example, how much each spends on supporting businesses. Paragraph 76 talks about potential duplication. SE and HIE offer similar forms of support. The arrangements for providing the, this support are complex. For example, SDI is a joint partnership between Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise and HIE. It is staffed by SE and Scottish Government and funded through SE. 
paragraph 77 explains that other forms of support are delivered by one body on behalf of all the others across all of Scotland. So, for example, Scottish Enterprise leads on the Scottish Investment Bank, major grants programmes, Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service and the Cooperative Development Scotland. But HIE leads on Community Broadband Scotland, Scottish Land Fund and Wave Energy Scotland. Now, Audit Scotland say it is not clear why some uh, forms of support are delivered jointly or on behalf of the others, and sometimes that just seems to be for historical reasons that everybody has forgotten. They also say it is not clear why sometimes support is delivered separately. For example, both organisations offer the same or similar products on training courses, which are developed, delivered and reviewed separately. And then finally, in paragraph 80, it describes how SE, HIE and the Scottish Government all have sector teams, for example, for food and drink. The three sector teams do collaborate, which is encouraging, but all do their own research and analysis. Now, I have to say, when I read a report like this, I get a bit concerned. Of course, HIDB and Now High have done a tremendous job in the Highlands and Islands. Everybody accepts that. And of course, we need specialist service for that region with all of its particular challenges. But maybe some things need to be updated. Maybe some things are a little bit out of date. Centralisation v decentralisation is a tricky subject. There is no one right answer for every situation. But from what I can see, we are trying to get the best of both worlds, and I welcome the government's plans. Thank you very much to members for keeping to time. I now to wait winding up speeches. Colin Richard Leonard, close for Labour. Four minutes, Mr Leonard, please. Yeah, thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Highlands and Islands Development Board was created by politicians of vision. And I'm bound to say to the Cabinet Secretary, where is the political vision for the Highlands and Islands in this mediocre phase one proposal of his? And I do not say this lightly, but it amounts to the re replacement of good policy with bad. Can I remind Parliament of some of the past chair people of the HIDB and High? Big figures, uh, not just in the public life of the Highlands and Islands, but big figures in the public life of Scotland. Robert Grieve, Andrew Gilchrist, Ken Alexander, who wrote that the board provided, and I quote, leadership and guidance to the development process, but also gave a substantial boost to morale in the area. Robert Cowan, Jim Hunter, these were and are people of towering intellect, of steely determination, fiercely independent, unafraid to challenge politicians, irrespective of party, in pursuing the best interests of the Highlands and Islands. These are the very voices of dissent and challenge which I fear the SNP now wishes to silence. The reasons for the creation of the Highlands and Islands Development Board were clear, and the clue is in the original name, the Highlands and Islands Development Board, with an independent board whose remit was to strengthen the economies and the communities of the Highlands and Islands, and to uphold the demand, the right, that people no longer should have to leave their islands, their villages, their communities, if they wanted work. It is to the credit of both the board and high that net migration from the Highlands and Islands has been reversed. But behind that global figure lie communities which are still fragile, economies which are still peripheral and so still in need of acute support and people, especially young people, who still leave to find work because there are not enough opportunities locally. These are precisely the reasons why a distinctive agency with strong independent leadership and its own ring-fenced budget is so essential. The very idea that one body can deal with everything from the funding of Scotland's higher education to the micro-economies of fragile crofting communities is an idea which beggars belief. This overarching board will have less knowledge of and even less interest in the very places that really do need an independent board. And the idea, the very idea that High will continue to operate unaffected, as we have been told by SNP speaker after SNP speaker in this debate this afternoon, has no ounce of credibility whatsoever. So I say to those members that before you vote tonight, go again and have a look at the stated aim in the government's phase one report. The action is being taken, it says, in order to strengthen governance and deliver the benefits of a single system. A single system. Go and have a look again at John Swinney's parliamentary answer on the 23rd of November, 
when he told Ian Gray, and I quote, the overarching board will replace individual agency boards. So I say to SNP members, make no mistake, Highlands and Islands Enterprise is being administratively disemboweled in your name. Let me finish with this. We do not need a Scotland-wide statutory board, business-led, chaired by the Cabinet Secretary in Edinburgh or Glasgow, determining budgets, operational priorities and so on. These should be decided as closely as possible to the people affected in the Highlands and Islands. It is my fear that the SNP members in this Parliament are in denial, but I say to them, this is no time for silence. This proposal was not in the manifesto upon which you, you were elected, so stand up and represent the views of your constituents, not your party leaders, and support this motion tonight. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. I call on Keith Brown to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Five minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. It's certainly been a, a stimulating and interesting debate where we've had reference, uh, we've had reference to Henry VIII, uh, spies in the bars of the House of Commons, uh, Donald Trump and even disemboweling. Um, despite that, I think uh, some very important points are made. And I would just reiterate the point that I uh, am listening to the points that have been made by members and will be taking those on board. I've said that when I opened and I make that commitment again uh, just now. And also make the uh, commitment uh, or repeat the commitment that we've made to high and recognise the significant contribution that it's made, as a number of members have said, over the last 50 years in terms of the economic transformation uh, of the region. There's a couple of specific points raised by um, uh, 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 sorry, I forget his name now, Andy, Andy Whiteman, sorry. Um, one was to say, well, uh, the amalgamation, he, he referenced the amalgamation of the agencies. The agencies are not being amalgamated, just to confirm that point. And also he raised a question about the future uh, process that will depend upon, as I said at the committee, the outcome of the governance review because that will determine the remit and the nature, um, or help determine the remit and nature of the board. And that will determine what process follows on uh, from that. And I'll come back to him on the point about uh, legal personality. Um, just to say, the point was also made by, I think it was Richard Leonard, about where is the vision uh, for the Highlands. Now, it's been mentioned a number of times, we have a situation where, if you look at Inverness in particular, the A9 and the A96, no previous government has committed to the £3 billion for each of those projects, which has been promised for many years, that has been taken forward by this government. The city deal was referenced earlier on. The biggest contributor to the city deal was the Scottish government. Of course, it also involved High as well, of course. And I would say, make the point that much of what's happened in the Highlands has been with the active collaboration, not just with High, but in relation to the other huge project, uh, Rio Tinto, the saving of those jobs and the building upon those jobs, the huge economic impact that will have in that area. If you think of the number of jobs given the population uh, sp uh, sparsity in that area, that was done with a joint effort with Scottish Enterprise and High. We want to see more of that happening. That's part of the vision for this. Also, if you look at smaller projects, one like the, uh, the Mustardlock to Fockabers Bypass. 50 years people have been campaigning for that. That was undertaken uh, by this government. The Berrydale Braes are being addressed just now. Again, a long-term uh, ambition, certainly from the times when I uh, went to the Highlands uh, in childhood. And also uh, many other projects in relation to health, in relation to life sciences. Uh, the college was mentioned. Again, the government provided support for that and provided uh, the support to the agencies which were involved in that as well. So that is the vision. Uh, the vision is really encapsulated in what's been talked about, about the transformation of the Highlands uh, over many years. And it's also the inspiration, as I mentioned earlier on, for some members, not, for, not one member has mentioned it, but the creation of a new board, which kind of stands again the, against the idea of centralisation of the South of Scotland uh, agency, which is also being established. So that's the vision that we have for the hands to continue with that achievement. Uh, I will do, yes. Rhoda Grant. I'm not sure if it was a slip in the, off the tongue, but you said you were creating a new board for the South of Scotland. Why would you abolish High and then create a new board for the South of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. You're creating a new agency for the South of Scotland, that's what I said. In fact, I think that's in the outcome of the, the phase, one, uh, phase one discussion. The plans that we're putting forward uh, are about improving the services High is able to offer and giving businesses and individuals in the Highlands. Now, there's been much talk, and you know, I understand that point about the value of the board. There should be more talk about the value of the employees of High who provide those services, who will still be there after this review, providing those services to the businesses and to the individuals in the Highlands, which are so valued by people locally. And I believe that these reforms and the setting of key local and national economic ambitions for all of our agencies, 
the, all the parties in here over the periods when they've been in government have bemoaned the lack of uh, growth and also productivity, also export growth over many years. These um, proposals are sought to try and address that. The excellent speech, I think, made by Katie Forbes and also the particular reference to increase internationalisation and export within the Highlands is central to what we're trying to achieve in relation to that. And I would hope to get support from that from members. I am undertaking, I've said already that uh, I've had a number of correspondence, uh, cor pieces of correspondence from members which I'm responding to or have responded to. I'm also willing to meet with any individual members. I've met with some already. Uh, some I've gone and initiated that uh, myself, and I will continue to do that. I think a very important point that was made is about the timescale for this. We will have the Lauren Creer-led uh, governance review very shortly, and of course, members may want to stick to the position they have just now. I understand that point, but they might want to do that in the knowledge of what's been proposed by the chair of High at that time. And I would hope members would take that uh, with an open mind, and I'm certainly willing to engage in further discussion at that point and to work with members across the chamber. I uh, move that the Parliament recognises this is the purpose of the amendment, the vital work that High carries out for businesses and communities across the Highlands and Islands. But also I think it wel should welcome the commitment we've made to retain High, its legal status, its chief executive, its management team, its local base, local decision making. And let's see what the total sum of that decision making uh, power is, what the remit of that is whether that contains new powers in relation to skills, for example, which would be welcomed in the Highlands and go further. And also, I don't understand the point that's been made about police and fire reviews from parties which supported, supported the unification of those boards and now criticise it. Um, I think this is a very important review. It will have the effect, and it should be tested by, measured by, uh, justified by the extent to which it improves things in the Highlands in terms of export and productivity. So I would ask that, that uh, people approach that with an open mind and that the other agencies within the Enterprise and Skills Review are also recognised in their efforts to drive the changes needed to further improve the economy of the Highlands and Islands and the rest of Scotland. Collaboration is what will work for the Highlands in this area. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Colin Douglas-Ross to close the Conservatives. Mr Ross, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And unfortunately, I won't be able to take any interventions because I've got a lot to get through to wrap up all to wrap up all the interventions and speeches we've had today, because today's debate has shown that the SNP plans for centralisation of the a HIE are ill thought out, lack any support from parties out with the SNP, and threaten the excellent work done by HIE for decades throughout the Highlands and Islands. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I know we don't use the L word in this chamber, but Kate Forbes on Twitter this morning, when she was saying she was uh, going to put across her own views on HIE, said she was responding to, and I quote, the outright lies I'm hearing from the Tories on HIE. Well, those are very strong words, and I don't think they've been replicated in this chamber today. Call, no, I've said that. Calling Scottish Conservatives liars. There is, it is for the member to decide. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Calling Scottish Conservatives liars because we have taken such a strong position against these SNP centralisation plans begs the question why we've gained so much support for our opposition. As this debate has shown, every member of every party except the SNP know the threat that HIE is under if it's subsumed into a national body. And while we're on the topic of misinformation, how disingenuous was it of the First Minister to stand up in this chamber and say to John Finney just weeks before these plans were announced that, and I quote, HIE has done a fantastic job over the last 50 years. I can give an, insurance, uh, an assurance that we will make sure it is in a position to carry out those functions and provide the excellent services it does to the Highlands of Scotland. Well, I say to the First Minister and I say to SNP members, that position is at the heart of the Highlands and Islands where it has been doing its excellent work for decades, not dragged down to the central belt as part of a national body. I do want to go over a number of the points raised by several members. Rhoda Grant was quite right to say the firm roots that the Highlands and Islands enterprise has in the region and highlighted the fact that Keith Brown can't and certainly hasn't given an assurance where it will be based within the region. Edward Mountain spoke about his experience as a surveyor and also the Inverness City deal and the new campus which he has seen the great work that HIE have done in collaboration with that. Kate Forbes then continued that example of great work done by HIE including the 150 new jobs at the Loch Arbor Smelter, the A9 house building. I would have to ask, if they've done all this great work, why are you having to change it? <laughs> no, I can't take any interventions. Please, David, please Stewart, sit down, David Stewart gave a history. Please sit down, Ms. Forbes. Oh, 
David Stewart gave a history of HIE, which I thought was very useful. He then also moved on to uh, parliamentary history by quoting Henry VIII. I have to say I was momentarily distracted looking at the front bench, wondering which of the SNP uh, government ministers looked least like Henry VIII. But I quickly got back into my swing when I listened to Ivan McKee the SNP MSP for Glasgow Proven, who after announcing that he's the parliamentary liaison officer to the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities, read out exactly the party line. <laughs> Andy Whiteman then asked three crucial questions, and I, I think they were partially answered, but clearly not fully answered by the Cabinet Secretary, and I'm sure John Finney had well briefed Mr Whiteman on that point. Liam MacArthur rightly highlighted the excellent campaign that the PNG have raised on this issue, and Dean Lockhart uh, said quite rightly that the Scottish Government should follow Audit Scotland's advice and get their own house in order before looking at scrapping the board of HIE. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, living and working in Murray my whole life, I've seen the benefits our area has gained from HIE lo locally, and I know this is replicated across the Highlands and Islands. The only people defending this move are elected SNP politicians. And I say elected SNP politicians because there are some SNP members who disagree with the plans. Jim Hunter has been quoted ad nauseum today by Donald Cameron, Edward Mountain, David Stewart, twice by Liam MacArthur and by Dean Lockhart. But still, I have an unused quote from him criticising his own party's plans. He said, and I quote, as an SNP SNP member. I hope the party's Highlands and Islands MSPs join with others to reject the Scottish Government's plans for HIE. And that leads me very nicely on to a quote from Keith Brown, which he gave in the Parliament yesterday. He accused us on these benches of doing as we're told by the UK Government. He continued, we would not do that. We are here to represent the people of Scotland. So I say, to Richard Lockhead, to Kate Forbes, to Gail Ross, to Marie Todd, to Fergus Ewing, to Mike Russell, to Alistair Allen, at decision time tonight, will you do what the SNP government tell you to do, or will you represent the people of Scotland? <laughs> Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, as we head towards the council elections, people will be considering who to support to stand up for the area against centralisation like the type the SNP are imposing on HIE. The public should know that their local SNP candidate won't support this area. Now, how do I know that? Well, I have the voting record in my hand from a recent meeting of Highland Council. That meeting had a motion in front of it from the independent leader, Councillor Margaret Davidson, which raised concerns about the government's plans for HIE. The motion said, such an approach is not in the best interests of the Highlands and Islands. It continued, the council condemns further distancing of decision-making and strategy from local communities. That motion was agreed by 44 votes to 14. So who were the 14 local members of Highland Council who you would expect to be standing up for their local area but voting against the motion? They were the entire SNP group at the Highland Council meeting. They say they stand up for Scotland, but really they just stand up for whatever Nicola and the SNP government tell them to do. And people should not forget that in May. While the SNP won't stand up for local communities, Parliament can speak for them at decision time tonight. MSPs have sent a strong message to the SNP in this debate, and I urge members to support the Conservative motion tonight so Parliament as a whole can add its voice against these plans. Thank you very much, Mr Ross. That concludes the debate on Retain, the Highlands and Islands Enterprise Board. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. I'll give a few moments for the front benches to swap places.